Have you ever wondered if you can avoid every distraction in life by focusing on what matters? That's what we'll talk about today. If you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. Alan K. Simpson. Today we're going to talk about the book, Things That Matter, Overcoming Distraction to Pursue a More Meaningful Life by Joshua Becker. If you don't know who Joshua Becker is, he used to be a pastor, and then he wrote his books about minimalism and how important it is. This book was a little bit different. I like minimalism. I certainly don't sign on to it. You wouldn't look at my house and say that I do. But I understand the principles behind it. I think there's some valuable lessons in all of it. But this book is more about application. And we'll talk a lot about what he means when he talks about finding the things that really matter in life. He would fall in that Christian, stoic realm of things, you know, where his beliefs about focusing on the importance, focusing on purpose, and getting rid of everything else that's just not important. When we do that, we're able to follow through on the things that matter the most, get those things done, and give our lives meaning. He talks about how a lot of people think of him as the guy who helps you clean out your house, who gets rid of stuff, who keeps you from buying things you don't need. But he says that the thing that matters the most to him, the thing that gives him meaning in life, is helping people to find their own meaningful life that he wants people to focus on the things that are very important. And so he asked the question, quote, if you were to die today, what one thing or few things would you be most disappointed that you weren't able to complete? Now I know a lot of you are thinking book series, TV series, and then you're just kidding. There are things that matter to you. And he started a survey that is called Things That Matter Survey. And he wondered if people say that they have a purpose, a clear purpose in life. And he was happy because about 70% of people think that they do have a clear purpose. Another 11% were unsure and the rest were no. And so the question is, is can you start fulfilling those purposes, go after the things that matter the most? Is there something that you can do to start choosing our life better, to start living with out regrets, and choosing the life we want to have. He says that every morning he starts his day with a mantra asking himself what he commits to that day. And he thinks that if you do that, it'll keep you on focus every day. I agree with that. I think it's a good idea to commit yourself to something every morning. But I also think that we have to have a viewpoint of the future this sort of true north look at our lives to know what that thing should be. Otherwise, sometimes I can get in a real busy mode and that thing I commit to for the day is calling the insurance company. No, that's not a purpose in life. That's not the goal in life. That's something I had to do. So I think we have to divorce ourselves from tasks we have when our to-do is of the things that we think we need to do that day from what purpose are we serving that day. And sure enough, sometimes you have to call the insurance company, get a doctor's appointment, return the library books, whatever it is. Of course, there's things to do. But the question is, is can you identify what matters the most? And so he asks us to think about your life and who you serve and who you love. And if we could get rid of the distractions of all the other things, would we be in a place where we could get those things to accomplish the things that we have for our lives. And this was my favorite quote in the book. The enemy of intentionality and a life well lived is distraction. Know your enemy. It's not so much that things that are distractions are necessarily bad, but in this case, he's calling them the enemy. And why is it the enemy? Because it's keeping us from doing the thing that matters the most to us. It's keeping us from doing the thing that will give our lives purpose, that will make the world a better place, make the people around us better. And that's the problem with distractions. Talked about it a million times. I like movies and television shows and video games, and I read a lot of books, like to go camping. 
But the question is not so much about these distractions, but are they keeping me from doing the things that I find matter the most to me? And in a survey, he asked the question if people felt that they were spending their time on less important pursuits at the expense of the things that matter the most. And of course, 76% said yes. So we all know it's happening to us. Do we fight it? Maybe we don't want to fight it. Maybe we hope that we can continue to play our video games, do all our distractions so that we don't have to focus on the things that matter the most. Because sometimes those things that matter the most are hard. They take time. They're a big commitment. And so maybe we secretly hope that those distractions actually win. I know sometimes I do too. And he says that when the distractions turn into the eventual lifestyle, they are become our lives. We're now gamers. We're now book readers. I'm a book reader. We're now television watchers instead of it just being a little side hobby that we do every once in a while to de-stress. So that's the point where we've lost control over our lives. And he said for sure that some things are shinier than others. They attract us more than others. I know that there are things that I have been addicted to in my life that not bad addictions, but drag me away from improving my life. And I know what they are. And I've done a good job of slowing those down, stopping those, not falling for those anymore. But we have to realize what are those objects that are really pulling us away? It's almost like how I think about snacks. You know, I can't have the snacks I love in this house because if I have the snacks I love in this house, I lose control over eating them. So instead, I buy snacks I kind of like in the house. And that way, I don't get so enamored with them that I just feel like I just eat them all the time. And I get a little disappointed. Oh, is that my only snack? Okay, I guess I'll eat that. And then I just have a little of it, and it's fine. It's a pretty good tactic. But in some ways, I think that these distractions are almost the same. If it's so distracting to us, maybe it shouldn't even be in our houses or a part of our lives. I know that when I switched from Windows to Mac, I lost a majority of my games. And I lost the ability to play a majority of those games. And you know what happened? I suddenly found a ton of time to do almost everything else. And now I have a Steam Deck, and I like the Steam Deck. But it's not so enticing to me like the Windows computer or the Xbox or the PlayStation was that I actually found a way of playing just a little bit. The battery only lasts for two hours, and then I'm done. And somehow that made all the difference. So the question is, is can you get rid of the shiny objects so they're no longer a part of stealing all your time from you every day? And he says it's important that we know the hours in the day never change. We will never get more. And it becomes important that we start having to sacrifice those things that we find as shiny objects and start focusing on the things that are important. Thus the book. That's what the whole point of the book is. He says in the end that we should be defining ourselves, laying out the rules for our lives and walking down the path that we want to walk down. Or is it that those distractions are telling us who we are? They're the ones ruling our lives. They're the ones that are telling us what we do after work, what we do before work, and what we do right up to bedtime. Who's in control at that point? If you can't break away from whatever it is you're doing and start living your life, maybe it's time you took back your life. And so he said that sometimes people have distractions because of fear, that we're scared to do the thing that we want to do, we're scared to do our dreams, or distractions are keeping us in a place where we don't have to be scared. Super comfy. Sit with my bag of chips, play my video games, and I don't have to worry about the scary goals I have in my life. Or maybe we have distractions because we've screwed up in the past and we think we've hurt people. And by not doing what we want in life and not doing what we love in life, we won't hurt other people. Or maybe we have distraction because we're trying to make ourselves happy. We think that this is the thing that's going to make me happy. If we don't change and we don't improve our lives, 
I'll be happy. I was happy yesterday. I was happy playing video games. And I'm going to be happy tomorrow playing video games. Sorry, I'm using the video game thing, but that's the one that's closest to me. And you think maybe you're not even going to be happy if you don't have whatever it is that you lean on in order to get away from what your real dreams are. He says then there's the distraction of leisure, which means we're relaxed. I work hard. I'm tired at the end of the day. I can't pursue my dreams. I just need to chill out, watch a few TV shows, and enjoy my time. We shouldn't give up on the things that matter the most to us just because we've turned our whole lives into a year-long vacation or retirement as sometimes giving up on everything that we had to do. Now I'm free. I'm retired. So it's not an excuse to give up on our dreams just because we want leisure. And then he says, then there's the distraction of technology. Ooh, there's another big one for me. I'm a nerd. I love technology. But am I playing with technology instead of actually doing something with technology? It had to go away for me. I used to be into testing and playing with almost everything and then also buying it, which put me into a financial problem. Now I have to have a purpose in place. I have to have a reason to go to Twitter, a reason to buy new technology because it's going to do something better for me. And I can't spend my whole life just playing with it. I have to get to the point where it makes me productive. And he says the problem is most people want to do the things that they dream about doing, about their goals, their purpose in life, and they just don't know how to get there. He says that it's about being safe instead of taking a risk. It's about being comfortable instead of looking to see what's possible around the next corner. So we have to choose risk so that we can get out of whatever rut we're in. If we don't, we could procrastinate and just never get to our thing that we want to do. We never take charge of our lives, and so we never get what we want. Or we set low expectations so that we never fail. You know, that's a fear thing, right? Instead of volunteering to this local animal shelter, I can do something easier and send $10. And then you send your $10, and now you're off the hook. But was that really your goal? But by achieving a lower goal, you feel like, well, I did enough. And then in the end, we maybe don't have the self-confidence we need to tackle our things. And so it's really the fear holding us back. And some people, they actually get physical problems from fear. They get headaches, they get stress, they get stomach aches. And so this stress of going out and trying to get their goals actually causes them physical discomfort. But again, we have to learn how to get over those things. I think when he's talking about doing something lesser, it's not about small steps. Small steps is how you get past a lot of these fears. Maybe you start with $10 of donating it to the animal shelter, but that's not where you end. You keep going and you keep taking the next smaller step. If you take a small step and you stop, then yep, you have given yourself a really mediocre goal. But if you can keep going forward, putting one foot in front of the other, that's where you're going to have accomplishments and you'll be able to get past that fear. The whole idea for me in this idea of small steps is that when you do small steps, they're easy. They're easy to accomplish and they're easy not to be afraid of because you're just taking the next step up. And I think that's what he's talking about here. This is how we get around fear. We stop thinking about our possible failures. We stop feeling that we're not good enough or that we're going to lose focus and we're just going to fail anyway. You know, all the fears that go into our goals can be cured, I think, by the small steps idea. But he says in the end, maybe it's time, quote, to jump while you can. No, I think that's important to take opportunities when they reach us. We think we have forever. We think we can do all sorts of things. If we have opportunities to take things, take risks, even if it might not work out. It leads towards our goals, our dreams, the things that matter the most, it makes 
all the difference in our lives and the lives of the other people we're going to affect. And he said that those risks are worth taking when our purpose is worth having. The book goes on to talk that at some point, maybe we need professional help. If something happened to us that affected us so much that we missed part of our development, that we can't get past our fears, if we feel like we're so unstable in our lives that we just can't make progress on our goals, perhaps getting help will help you make that next step, help you take whatever risk it is that will lead you to having that purposeful life. Maybe help you get over some of the anxiety or other things like depression that maybe are holding you back. So in the book goes into a chapter about getting help and gives you some ways to analyze your life and your thoughts to determine whether or not you should seek help. A lot of insurance companies include health when it comes to mental health now. And so it's worth taking that risk to do it if you feel it'll help you progress. And then sometimes there's even just guilt for getting our goals, for having a happy life. It might be holding you back as well. And so he says in the end, all we can do is go after our future. There's nothing we can do about our past. And in the end, it's important that we have a life that we're prouder, having worked harder, spent the time doing the tough things. I know when it looks like it's coming ahead of you, it stinks to do the harder thing. I did not want to go through the process of getting a new job. I was very comfortable. I liked my job and I was happy where I was at. This new job had so much potential and it was work. I will tell you that this company, this organization is really difficult to get into, has a lot of tasks. In fact, I'm not even quite done with the tasks and I've had the job for a month. But you know what? I realize now it was worth every moment every ounce of things I had to do, every level of discomfort I had to take. And hopefully I'm coming out the other side now, but it was difficult. But you know what? It's going to be a really good thing in my life. And I hope that you too can see your way through in going out and taking those risks, doing the hard thing, and then realizing that you'll be proud of yourself and you'll be happier because you've actually done the thing That was difficult. And now you have a means to live a more fulfilled life, one that offers you promise, comfort, security, whatever those things are that you're looking for, whatever values, whatever important things you're looking for, that little bit of stress is the first step to getting there. He reads a quote from Viktor Frankl, and you know how much I like Viktor Frankl, but it says, happiness cannot be pursued. It must be ensued. And it only does so as an unattended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as a byproduct of one surrendering to a person other than oneself. When you pursue goals that make other people happier, looks at the big picture, not only are you going to be happier, but your life will have purpose now. And he just says that, Right now, a lot of people are just living their lives to gain that consumerism, that perfect vision of a house and dog and car. And I get that too. I never had those things, you know, when I was growing up. And so it has built into me wanting that sort of ideal life. But you also have to think about bigger things. And of course, I have religious faith. I should be thinking about what I can do to pursue that in greater detail, not just the things that are my own happiness or my own goals, but what can I do to make the world a better place too? And again, if you think outside that box and you look towards making others happier, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. What he says is we can't look to fame, we can't look to success, we can't look to riches of money or power or anything, that if we keep trying to get ahead and do All the things that we think we have to do, we find out a lot of people aren't very happy. There was that quote that came from Jim Carrey that he said that he wished more people could get rich so they understood it wasn't the answer, which is really easy for a rich guy to say. But you know what? What if it's true? 
And that's the thing is that you want filling life, that happy life. And there was a joke that said, I know riches can't make you happy, but I'd like to try it out and see for myself. And that's what everyone thinks. But what if you skip the step of all the trappings of life and you go for the thing that gives you purpose, meaning, and helps other people at the same time? And if we just keep focusing in on ourselves and focusing in on these, I guess, traps of success, probably in the end, not going to end up happy. We might be satisfied. We might have happiness in pockets. But when we find that true thing, that's when we're going to be happy. Reminds me, and I keep bringing this podcast up, but the Ikigai podcast I did, which was episode 57. I don't know why, but I think out of all the books I read, that one ended up sticking with me just the most. It's that intersection of what are you good at? What do you dream of doing? What will help other people? And what can earn you an income? Because in the end, if you don't figure out how that you can also support yourself, you're going to be unhappy too. So that intersection, that ikigai is I think what he's talking about here. He says that we should embrace servanthood, that a lot of our mental health and all our goals and depression and unhappiness seems to be wrapped up in this focus of the self. We're so self-centered, whether we're happy or we're not happy, but instead, can we make our happiness not just about pursuing our gifts, not just about pursuing our goals and our purposes, but serving other people. When we get that, it'll be everything. He says that, you know, doing good acts of charity and other things that are helpful. I mean, all the acts of charity we can do are good for us and good for other people. But that, quote, unselfishness is a quality you acquire when you go and do something for others. And he gives a bunch of ideas that you could visit patients in a hospital, you can listen to someone, you can mentor youths who are in trouble. I remember once, and I didn't even go there to do this, but I was waiting for my friend whose mother worked in a home for older individuals. And I was talking to this woman and suddenly she just opens up to me and talks about, just wonders if her daughter's going to forgive her. And I sat and talked to her, prayed with her for a while. It was just the weirdest spur of the moment, me just sitting waiting for my friend. And you suddenly felt like you were listening to someone who just needed an ear, someone to tell her it was going to be okay and to hold her hand. It's one of those weird, you know, 20 minutes of my life that has stuck with me. I mean, that it was just random. And now I just think about that all the time. Think about her all the time. He quotes P.J. O'Rourke, who was an amazing humorist if you've ever read anything by him, but it says, quote, everybody wants to save the earth. Nobody wants to help mom do the dishes. And so he says, let's help mom. That's what we want to really do. We think about the big things, but in the end, sometimes when we're doing the little things and helping people one at a time, that's when we're making the biggest change in the world. We could make a minuscule change in something big and national and all the things we think about, or we could change somebody's life forever by doing the small things in our community, in our neighborhoods. And so don't look for that trap of the big deal, but instead look how you can help people around you. He says that he even wants you to have an experiment for the week. Give away $5. Do whatever. Drop it in a kettle, (laughs) donate it to a charity, whatever it is, but go ahead and just start small with making your life about other people. So my challenge to you is going to pick up on what his challenge to you is. See if you can help someone this week in a way that fits with your purpose in life, a small step in the right direction. So it can be any kind of help at all. But the only rule I'm giving is it has to be something related to where your purpose lies in life. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. 
I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com and tell me what you think about a podcast, about a topic, or about a topic you'd love to hear about. I'm always happy to hear what interests you. Have a wonderful week. And remember, finding purpose and clearing away the distractions starts with small steps.